Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. I hope all of you are having a great week so far because, hey, you know, uh, coming off the weekend, I know that, uh, you know, people down south have not been having as easy of a time. And we, of course, you know, wish all of them well. We've been keeping a close eye on what Harvey has been doing. And my goodness, that is a lot of water. So, again, hopefully all of you safe, dry, and warm and comfortable as we kick off Computer America here for another week. So, today on the program, we have uh, you know someone who's been on the show a number of times, and we definitely enjoy that because this is talking about a subject that I think a lot of you out there are have at some point tried to dabble in, and you know I think even more of you have said, wow, there's a lot of crappy video out there. Well, our guest today is here to help you with just that. So before we get to Mr. Steve Stockman, we have a few things to go over, including ComputerAmerica.com. And that's where you'll find everything from guests to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to links to our guest website, books, and things like that. Uh, When we do computer and technology news, we'll, of course, uh, you know, have all the links that we cover in the show notes so that if you're working, if you are driving or what have you, Well, don't worry, ComputerAmerica.com, your one-stop shop for today's show. Uh, Also, be sure to check out the live video stream where you can watch Computer America, not just listen, always fun. And then the last thing is, of course, the contest. Every single Friday, Logitech gives away a prize to one of our lucky listeners every single Friday. And hey, we could be calling your name. Find out how to do that and more at ComputerAmerica.com. Now... Again, let's uh, let's re- let's reintroduce our guest. So, Mr. Steve Stockman, how to shoot video that doesn't suck, has a number of different uh, you know uh, TV campaigns, uh, television shows, movies, things like that under his belt. He's a teacher, and hey, we have him on the show quite often to teach you guys how to shoot video that doesn't suck. Because, as I said, you all have the tools. If you have a smartphone, you have the tools to make something really special. But you also have the tools to make something really painful so steve welcome on to computer america once again thanks for joining us thanks ben great our, to be here yeah yeah our pleasure great to be here yeah our pleasure indeed so uh you know again happy to have you back on and i guess we'll start with the obvious um for anyone out there who maybe this is the first first time hearing of steve stockman uh you know give us a how little is bit that of, even possible i, I mean, know for god's sake I know. So give us a bit of background on uh, on yourself. Great. Well, I am a director and writer by trade. Um, written hundreds of commercials. Did a feature film called Two Weeks with Sally Field a few years back. I do TV shows like uh, Brew Dogs and uh, Dogs of War, which are completely different, even though they both, both have <laughs> dogs in the title. Uh, did shows for Food Network. Have shows we're working on now. And... That's how I make a living. And then as kind of a fun hobby, I wrote this book called How to Shoot Video That Doesn't Suck. Yeah. And it turns out, um, if I may blow my own horn for just a minute, uh, it's the best-selling how-to video book in the world. It's in six languages. And um, the, the new edition is out right now on Amazon uh, and everywhere else that you buy your books. And it's honestly not that new. If you already own it, don't worry. But I took out a few archaic references that snuck into things like the iPod Nano that they don't make anymore. Um, But because the book isn't a technical book in the first place, there weren't very many of those. Mm -hmm. So we cleaned it up. I added a few new movies to the to the appendix where I listed all the movies you should totally watch because there are some new ones since the book was originally printed. And that's it. It's fresh. It's new. It's available. So yeah, I, I'm, if I'm you sure. Want it in Polish, you can get it in Polish now too. Polish, even better. I, I'll, 
yeah, sure. I'll have to learn Polish just to uh, just to read that part. But no, I, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that must have been, uh, you know, kind of sort of difficult because, you know, even nowadays, I, uh, and not to, you know, kind of call out names because you know, it's whatever. Uh, uh, Katy Perry, she has a new music video out, blah, blah, blah. It made social media and made the rounds uh, because of how, and you know, I guess how hard she tried to make a compelling video, but it came off as... Uh, you know, trying a little bit too hard. And there were, I think, references that are not going to age well at all. I, I mean, you know, and mm. uh, a lot of callbacks to, you know, things that happened a year ago, six months ago, that people are probably going to forget six months to a year from now. It's uh, it's hard to make something that won't, you know, age, you know that, that, that will age well because references are so easy and they seem like a good idea at the time, but I guess they aren't, are they? Well, I, you know, as someone who just had to clean up a bunch of them, um, I think they still are a good idea because, you know, as an artist, you're trying to do references that will kind of shorthand messages to people. Uh, so I haven't seen Katie's video, but I'm sure that the intent is to kind of deliver a message quickly without having to explain the whole thing by, you know, shorthand referencing things that have happened in the past. And that's a common thing. I mean, one of the analysis of Shakespeare that you have to go through if you do that course in college is what were his contemporary references that we no longer understand at all? And what do we do with those? So I feel a little, I feel a little sorry for Katie. You know, it's a normal thing to do is to, is I, to refer to what's going on around you. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you feel sorry for her. I mean, I'm sure she's made, uh, you know, the song, the, the song <laughs> will go out okay. on the radio. Yeah, yeah. She's doing okay. Katy Perry, do not worry about her. Um, but the whole thing was really, truly just an advert for just dance 2018. So, you know, it's, uh, it is there what it am. is. Marketing is marketing, but now and we're in 400 years. We'll take that video apart and go, <laughs> what did she mean by that? <laughs> I'm just sure like Shakespeare now. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, yeah, she has, maybe not. She has the test of time, I'm sure. But all right, so Steve Stockman had a shoot video that doesn't suck. And, you know, the last couple of times you were on the show, we've talked about different elements of your book, um, you know, because it's the idea that, you know, I, I've said it a couple of times, but it's worth repeating that you can have something, as, you know, you don't have to have a DSLR that can shoot video and tripods and thousands of dollars worth of lenses and equipment to shoot something that people will actually want to watch. It's just in your pocket, and you know, if you have a smartphone in the past two or three years, you have one of the most powerful cameras out there. So, I, I guess the question is, and you know, you brought up this topic today of how to move from still frames because I admit this is what I do. It's much easier to set up a photo, I feel, you know, just to you know, kind of do the white balance and just do the controls on the smartphone, and getting that one still image is so much easier than I feel getting anything compelling that would be, you know, 6, 10, 12, a minute long. So I guess your topic is how to move from still photography, which I feel a lot of us do, to something that can act, you know, can maybe even be a little bit better with video. Yeah, and I think most people hesitate to go from still photography to video because video is so much more complicated. And that complication is that you can move the camera during the shot. And that stymies people sometimes because if you're taking a still picture, you're going to hold your camera up and you're going to look through the lens and you're going to say, okay, what do I want to be focusing on? And the first thing you're going to do is see the point of focus. That is, you're going to look and go, well, if this is a picture of my daughter, is it a good picture of my daughter? Can I see her face? Is she well lit? Is she standing in a good part of the frame? Am I close enough? Am I far away enough? Am I getting the background that I want to get? And we're all used to doing that for still photos. I mean, when people Instagram, you know, they spend, I've seen people spend 10 minutes at a table making sure that their food was styled properly. And so they take this photograph mm -hmm. and it's perfect. So I think we're used to thinking about all this stuff when we take stills. And then when you go, okay, now do video, everybody goes, oh my God, there's so much more to worry about. And I guess my first message is, you know, there isn't that much more to worry about. <laughs> um, you're adding motion, right? So you're adding a verb to your noun. So a picture of Sarah is just a picture, but 
Sarah walking is now a video, right? So you've added the first thing that you have to think about is what's the action that's going on. And you're well on your way. If you're a skilled photographer, I've had, you know, wedding photographers who've shot weddings for years, have all kinds of fancy equipment mm -hmm. and they're scared of video. And the first thing to realize is that if you can compose a still frame and it's and it looks nice and feels the way you want it to feel, you are light years ahead of most people. That most of the great cinematographers in the world are first great photographers. Hmm. Uh, and that one of the ways to think about video to begin with is don't think of it as a moving picture, by which I mean you behave exactly the same way that you would behave if you were shooting still photography. So if you're going to shoot your first your first foray into video, set it up the way you would a still. So if you're at a wedding shooting wedding pictures, you're going to position yourself where you can get a great shot of the bride and you're going to watch her through your lens and you're going to look at the background and you're going to look at the lighting and you're going to look at her face and you're going to look at how close you are and then you're going to snap off a shot, right? Right. If you if you want to do effective video, you do exactly the same thing. And the only difference is you're going to hold that shot for five seconds and then stop, or maybe eight seconds and then stop, so that you're going to get a moving picture of the bride instead of a still picture. But from your standpoint, it's the same action. You're going to get into position. You're going to look at everything in the background. You're going to hold totally still you're going to let your camera run for five or six seconds and you're going to turn it off. I guess, and, 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 and I'm sorry to, uh, to interrupt your flow, no but, ju but just, uh, you know, I guess part of the question that I have immediately is what instances or what purposes would you say a video is better than a photo? Because, you know, obviously photos are not always inferior to video. Um, what are you, or what, what kind of message would you, uh, recommend someone capture because you meant you know uh, five to eight seconds that's that's what you recommend in your book shoot short shots mm -hmm. that you can kind of edit together later um, mm -hmm. so I mean what message are you trying to uh, you know capture with with that short video well I think when you're a photographer looking through your lens for a beautiful picture you're waiting for a moment right you're waiting for you're waiting for that turn smile click and you've got the bride beautifully looking at her brand new husband out of the side of her eyes and she's kind of glowing in that direction and it tells you a story right right so in video you're doing exactly the same thing except that instead of looking for the moment you're looking for the action so an action is something that has a beginning middle and end so i'm holding a a marker in my hand if i let go of that marker with my fingers and it drops to the tabletop. If I had had my camera on that as a still, I might shoot the marker in the hand. I might shoot the marker in the air falling toward the tabletop. I might shoot a hand over a marker that's on the tabletop, right? I right. could shoot all those things. In video, we're capturing the entire action. So the beginning of the action is fingers let go. The middle of the action is marker falls. The end of the action is marker lands on the table and now I'm done. So instead of looking for the moment, I'm looking for the action. So okay. if we go back to the wedding, instead of that moment where the bride turns toward her brand new husband and gives you that one look that you're looking for, you're instead thinking about what is she doing over there and what is he doing? And now I'm going to frame it the same and I'm going to light it the same and I'm going to look for the same beauty in the background but I'm going to think about her actions. So now I'm going to take the whole time at the beginning of the shot where she turns her head and in the middle of the shot where she finds her husband and the end of the shot is she gives him that smile. I and so you. now instead of looking for instant, I've looked for action. Does that make sense? No, no, makes perfect sense because you know I, I was kind of getting confused about you know obviously you can take a you could you know just like you mentioned you could take a uh, a photo of each one of them but I guess putting it to a short clip would be you know obviously preferable um, you know there so all right please and uh, uh, well, continue. I'm not saying pre preferable. I'm it's a different art form, right? Right, right. So 
So I happen to love still photography and I wouldn't trade Ansel Adams for anybody, right? Or, or some of the other great still photographers or artists who work in a still medium. Uh, very exciting, wonderful stuff and massively important to today's communication because, you know, Instagram, Facebook and all these other things work a lot on, on stills. But I think that video gives you an extra dimension of, uh, communication so, yeah and and i guess uh you know to tie it into something that didn't work though um you know just kind of give me your opinion there was a thing called vine and you could talk about marketing you could talk about companies that owned it and things like that blah 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 but the idea of it seemed to be right up your alley in what you're trying to push and you know admittedly a lot of people got very very famous doing vine but it was short five to six second uh videos it could tell a story in and you know kind of that was it would you recommend people kind of take the same approach if they're doing, because I feel like a lot of people uh, right now you still uh, photography and I see it every single day on Instagram, Facebook, you know, Twitter, they take photos where I think video would be just as applicable and you can completely do video on all these mediums. Um, you know, is the, do you think the idea of trying to go from still photos to five, six, seven, eight second video clips would that, improve you think a lot of people's you know just kind of outreach to friends and family um it depends on whether they're good at it or not right <laughs> that's why um, you're here and the reason i say that is because uh we don't have a lot of time in the world so if you're asking someone to process a 60 minute 60 second video or or god help us a three minute video right if it isn't any good you've just blown your opportunity to communicate with people and you would have been better off with a photograph. Um, so this is about how are you doing at it mm -hmm. as much as is one inherently better than the other? Because I, I know photographers who can say more in a single frame than I can say in two minutes. They're just that good, right? right. But all things being equal, you can communicate more stuff with a video. So, so the thing about the thing about video is that when you put shots together, we interpolate a story between them. So if we are shooting a, a detective story uh, for a TV show mm -hmm. and we shoot a, a shot of the detective uh, walking a perpetrator into the interrogation room and locking him to the desk in handcuffs, and then we cut to a shot of two people behind the one-way glass staring into uh, this room. Then we cut to a shot of the perpetrator being nervous, looking nervous. And then we cut to a shot of the detective as she sits down and looks incredibly tough and is about to say something surprising. The fact is that in video, all of these moving shots work together to tell story. They may have been shot on different days in different places, it doesn't really matter, but when you edit them together or string them together, you're telling a much more complete story, and it's harder to do that in photographs. Right. So you can't make a like a triptych where you see three pictures in a row, but it doesn't really work the same way. <laughs> right. No. Uh, and and by the way, if you visit uh, obviously SteveStockham.com, uh, link at Computer America, I see right here on the right, and it might actually apply to what we're trying to. Uh, convey as well you have a video about you know three minutes long like you said but uh you know five video tips to help you shoot video you know better so you know could you kind of uh, give people you know uh, some of those tips to shoot video better because again today's segment is all about moving from still to video and yeah people just don't know how to shoot good video i guess right so the first thing you want to do if you're going to move from still to video your first tip is Treat your video camera like a still camera. So you don't move. Now you line up your shot, you wait for some good action or you create some good action on camera. Uh, if you're shooting something that's scripted or something that you're you know, making for work or something and you hold your camera still, you start it when you want to and you stop it after you've gotten a complete action on camera, like bride turning to husband, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's tip one is, don't move your video camera around. Right. You know, you will never see a movie or where somebody started the camera at zero 
and then ran the camera nonstop for 120 minutes and then turned it off and then put it in the theaters. It doesn't work that way. Every shot yeah. in a movie is short and most of them don't move the camera. I, I, most and, of them. And I feel like I have seen that, but like that was like the shtick of the movie with uh, like, you know, there's like the first person view where like, you know, you put yourself in, in the seat of the person or there was that one Russian film that, you know, had a single continuous 120 minute shot. But no, you're right. You uh, most scenes do last only a matter of seconds before they cut to, you know, another angle, another view, another perspective. Yeah, you, you can do it as a stunt. I mean, the last right. 45 minutes of Children of Men looks like it's one shot. Um, it isn't, but it looks like it. Um, the first five minutes of La La Land, you know, is one continuous appearing shot again it isn't really but it looks like it and those those can be done as stunts and as a way to call your attention to the fact that they're not cutting mm -hmm. but most of the time the reason that you want to keep your camera still and only let the action in the camera move is because if you're new at this and you're going from still photography to video it's hard to get a handle on focus on where you want people to look in the frame it's easy when it's a still because you're used to that but but if you're moving your camera you have to move it in a way that people are going to be able to still look where you want them to look and that takes some practice and the best way to practice is if you hold your camera still then whatever is moving in the frame is what we will watch so you'll watch that bride as she turns her head because You've got it all framed up on her beautifully, and she's the only one moving. Whereas if your camera were also waving around, now the camera action and her action have to work together in a way that focuses where you look, and that is an elevated skill set. So that's something you want to get to at some point, but not when you're first making this transition. Gotcha. All right, so, uh, so next tip. So, so if part one is treat your video camera like a still camera, part two is to think in terms of short shots and a shot delivers an action. So it's a noun plus a verb. In television and film, we run the camera for a reasonably long amount of time and we'll shoot, you know, a three minute take. But when it gets to the editor, it gets cut down into five second pieces. Hmm. So, so the way we would shoot a scene with two people talking is we'll have one camera and we'll shoot, let's say, a wide shot of them talking at a restaurant table. So you can see all of both people and they're sitting at the table. Then we're going to shoot that a couple times till we know we have what we want. Then we're going to move the camera and focus just on one of those people in a, a medium close up from the waist up. And we're going to shoot their dialogue as they run through the whole scene again then we're going to shoot the person on the other side and do the whole thing again then maybe we'll shoot an over the shoulder shot where we have a piece of one person in the frame and you're seeing the other person and do the scene again and then we might shoot super tight close-ups where you're right in somebody's face and you're seeing their eyes or just their mouth or maybe you're seeing their head uh, giant and we shoot that whole scene again so we'll shoot long shots, but what ends up being used are these five second fragments that go together so that we can control the best way to present the scene. Now, if you're just transitioning from photography to video, mm -hmm. you may not want to get into editing right away, which is completely legitimate. Editing is a whole complicated discussion on its own. But you can edit in camera very easily by practicing shooting short shots so that what falls out of your camera is already edited. And it's not a perfect system, but it will take you from a lousy video to a watchable video in a hurry. So if you focus on, you're holding your camera still, you're pointing at the bride, you hit record and you watch the counter or you think to yourself, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, and then stop and go on to the next interesting action. Mm -hmm. When you finish, all those shots will fall out in some cool order and you will have a video that's very watchable without having done any editing. That I think fits a lot of people's, so would, uh, yeah, uh, time scale. Yeah. And I think that, you know, these tips, these aren't like, rules of the only way to shoot video somebody emailed me that and said how can you 
give all these rules. It's like, well, they're not really rules. They're more like training wheels. So if you practice holding the camera still and getting great video shots as an intro to video, and you get really good at it, and you want to experiment with moving your camera or, or what it looks like if you walk with your subject or what happens if you pan from one thing to another in a shot, have at it. That's a good thing to do. But if you're just making that transition, hold your video camera still and think in short shots and put your stuff together um, one quick shot at a time. Gotcha. So, yeah, and and uh, I apologize if that was all five. Uh, I think I counted three. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, I've got, I've got billions. <laughs> right. And, and, and by the way, just a heads up, uh, you know, to you and to everyone else that we're going to have to say goodbye at the bottom of the hour. Um, you know, we have a lot of stories that we need to cover. And as I understand it, you have an engagement. So, I do. Yeah, yeah so, so we have about another five minutes. So I think in these last five minutes, we should talk about, uh, you know, hardware. Because I did want to ask you, I mentioned uh, recently we had on the show, oh my God, I should know this. Um, last week on the show, we had on uh, Rapu Technology that makes Zero Drone. And they make a drone that is consumer grade. And, you know, it's... It's targeted for you know families, first-time flyers. It's very easy to fly. It has a very good camera uh, on it that records straight to your phone. Very easy to use. Um, you know, there's other things like I think Red actually just put out their own smartphone with some crazy, impressive camera on it. Let's talk about camera hardware and what people what you would recommend for people to you know get started in in doing this kind of thing. Well, I would I would generally not recommend a drone. <laughs> um, drones are like they're a blast, and we've certainly used them, and they've been a real boon to filmmakers who no longer need to hire a helicopter to follow a moving car um, or someone skiing down a hill, which is fantastic, and we love them and we use them. But a drone and any other piece of camera equipment is only as good as the storyteller behind it. So the question that you need to ask with your drone work is, what are you showing and why? So how is using a drone helping you tell a story? How is using a particular camera or piece of equipment helping you tell a story? So I'd say if you're making that transition into video for the first time, mm -hmm. go with what you've got. You know, if you've got a, an iPhone or other smartphone with a great camera, use that until you recognize its limitations and think to yourself, gosh, I wish I had something better. And then you might use a DSLR camera um, with, a, with a really nice lens and you might record on that and with more lighting adjustments. And you might decide that that's all you need or you may decide that you wanna go professional at some point. But you make those decisions based on how you feel about the work that you're doing um, camera one, if camera one is a drone mm -hmm. and you haven't learned what to do with it or how to tell a story, you may have some fun with it. And it's, it's a blast to fly around and look at stuff and, and, uh, surprise people and, and have beautiful vistas, but it's not something anyone is ever going to want to watch, including you an hour from now. Yeah. Okay. And it, yeah. And, and I believe it was your tip that we've heard, uh, you know, last time you were on the show, it was, oh my God. Uh, yeah. Uh, the best camera is the camera that you have with you. And, you know, sometimes, Hey, you're not going to carry your drone everywhere. You're probably not going to carry, uh, you know, really any camera other than your cell phone everywhere. So the camera you have with you is the best, but Steve, I will say that, uh, again, you know, sorry that we can only keep you for so long, but, uh, this was fun. We'll definitely have you back on probably closer to the holidays when people start taking vacations and shooting family events, um, you know, always very important to, you know, get your message out there before Facebook is flooded with hour long kids in the pool videos. And you're like, wow, this was as boring as being there. So <laughs> with that being said, Steve, if people want to find out more, where can they go? What can they do? Uh, they should go to stevestockman.com and there are hundreds of articles all free with lots of advice. You can ask questions, um, you can uh, get links for free downloads of, uh, like if you're a teacher and you want to use video in the classroom, we've got a book for that. Uh, if you're just a storyteller and you want to learn how to do that better, we've got a free download for that. So go to the website, uh, get all the free stuff. 
enjoy it. If you decide you want to explore more, you can get the book pretty much anywhere they're sold. Very, very cool. So check that out, everyone. Again, links at computeramerica.com if you want to find it very simply or stevestockman.com. Steve, thank you so much. This is great. Thanks, man. Great to talk to you. Bye-bye. We are all Brother Wolf. Bye. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Hello, and welcome back to Computer America. We are just wrapping, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we just wrapped up with our guest, Steve Stockman, How to Shoot Video That Doesn't Suck. Obviously, a very compelling name and easy to remember, but if you want to relive any part of that, I know he said shoot in short shots, but we have the entirety of our 30-minute interview at ComputerAmerica.com. So, in the meantime, for the rest of the program, we have a number of news articles that we did not get to last week, and, you know, Recent developments, especially today, there's been a lot of really great stories, so we're going to do just that. So, Computer and Technology News is brought to you by Fire Dragon Security, and here we go. All right, so our first story that we're going to do today, and we have a number of them, but let's see, let's do this one. So we're gonna tie these two in together as best as we can and try to make it one concise story. But these two, uh, these two articles here, one from a gadget, one from TechCrunch, essentially have the same message. And let's see if we, oh, hey, it does work. So, and yeah, the message is, Whole Foods has officially been picked up by Amazon. The deal is finalized, there is no more to it. Whole Foods is now an Amazon subsidiary. What does that mean for you? Well, let's start with the first one. And I think this is gonna be the most pos uh, positive, you know, uh, you know obviously. But let's, uh, let's go to TechCrunch and Ms. Sarah Perez saying that Whole Foods, which is now uh, Whole Foods Amazon powered price cuts are live and having already expanded to include several grocery staples. And hey, this is the cool part. This was the part that Amazon was promised. And obviously, this is going to cost them a bit of money at the start. This is probably more, uh, you know, getting the word out there, getting people in, in the store. But, hey, I can't see anyone complaining that food at Whole Foods is now cheaper. Yeah, it's awesome stuff. And here we go. Amazon's $13.7 billion acquisition of Whole Foods closed today. And the grocer is already rolling out discounts on select food items as a result. And yeah, so it won't be across the board, uh, but for I think a lot of staples, a lot of apples and avocados, as the article mentions here, uh, milk, cheese, pasta sauce, meats, and more, they've all been, in some cases, cut by as much as 40%. Yeah, that much. It's, it's crazy what they cut. So... On Friday, Amazon has detailed how the merger between the two retailers would impact consumers. It noted that Amazon Prime would eventually be integrated into Whole Foods' point-of-sale system, allowing Prime members to receive special savings and other in-store benefits. Because Amazon Prime, you can see how that service is getting more and more attractive as Amazon reaches further and further into different markets. And Amazon also said that starting today, Consumers would see an immediate impact in the terms of lower prices on select on a selection of groceries. Hmm. And they have examples here of like how avocados, they've dropped the price, you know, of dollar. They used to be $2.50, now they're a buck fifty. 
and apples you know used to be uh, three dollars a pound now it's only two dollars a pound and yeah you know it's, it's, it's pretty dramatic again 40 percent in some cases so specifically amazon said items being discounted today would include the following include whole trade bananas uh, organic avocados large round eggs um you know things that are you know considerably more expensive than the alternatives and really things that i think most consumers really didn't have a thought of because they weren't ever given this option and it's kind of what made whole food the niche that it was you have things like animal welfare rated 85 percent lean ground beef so obviously the cows that the beef comes from were in some way you know uh treated more uh you know treated better than your average run-of-the-mill beef um you know they have things like organic apples of course organic rotisserie chicken i'm hungry already things like that and yeah less expensive and of course uh things like milk had been obviously uh tuned down and while amazon has said that fish like salmon would be one of the first seafood items to see a price cut a price cut we had originally understood that this would include fresh fillets and cuts, the kind behind the glass case at the seafood counter. And as it turned out, however, the packages of frozen salmon received the discount as well. And before, the Atlantic salmon was, you know, hey, a drop about $2 a pound. That's the point. The article does go into some detail about, you know, each and every one of the price cuts. I don't think we're going to get into all of them, but safe to say, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a good thing for a grocery chain whose reputation was centered around the idea that you probably couldn't afford to shop there. So, while many Whole Foods stores stayed open late Sunday night to make the price changes, but Amazon had given the stores an 11 a.m. deadline to have them completed, where some stores were working last minute to get their signage up, such as the one in San Francisco. Amazon plans for Whole Foods extend beyond more affordable groceries, where the company also uses the store as hubs. That's right, as hubs for uh, for this like uh, for this like ship to store e-commerce, such as you know think like Walmart, how you can order anything off of Walmart, and a day or two later you can go pick it up at Walmart after it ships out from its uh, distribution centers. And you can also use Whole Foods for returns and grocery delivery services. That's right. That would obviously be local, but having your groceries delivered from Amazon via one of the Whole Foods, uh, you know, store chains would obviously be something that Amazon couldn't really do before. So the eventual plan is to bring down the price of many of the grocery items in store and that could lead to further savings on on more staples ranging from bread to cereal to diapers and more obviously and they said that uh, many of the whole foods brands such as you know the ones that you would only see in whole foods will become available through amazon.com amazon fresh prime pantry blah 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 and prime now mixing the two as best they can to give you as much value out of them as possible and today, lower price and today's lower prices are considered a down payment on Amazon's vision, or in other words, a starting point. Where Amazon has said the company has not yet announced how long before more in-store discounts are rolled out, but store staff was unaware of others in the work this week. Hmm. So there you have it. If uh, you haven't been to Whole Foods since they first opened up in your area, hey, it could be a time to check them out once again. Because, yeah, you know, they, they have that obviously well-deserved reputation for being expensive. And Amazon knows that, and they're trying to get people to shake that notion immediately. You know, the, they don't want, Amazon doesn't want their grocery store chain to seem selective or gated. They want it to be open to as many people as possible, and they have made that investment. So, Expect Amazon to lose money on that deal for a good while, but I think they're willing to lose the money to get people in the door. And hey, this is competition. This is, you know, this is competition between Walmart and, and the likes, 
and that can only be a good thing for consumers. So check it out, Whole Foods, it's a big deal. All right, now let's go to what could possibly be another big deal. And this is one that we see in, in the works all the time. I really wanted to cover the story because, and it does get a bit long and we're going to, you know, try to breeze through this as quickly as possible. But we hear stories about lithium ion being dead or lithium ion going the way of the dodo because it's been around for so long. It's such a known technology that the next iteration of batteries is going to push technology hopefully much further than what lithium ion already has because lithium ion it's what is in power drills, it's what's in phones, it's what's in essentially everything that we use with a battery, you know, cars and storage, you know, storage devices, that when the next iteration of usable batteries comes to market, it's going to change almost everything that we do in terms of technology. And if it's viable, you know, it, it, it's going to be a really, really big move for you know, not, not just the market, but even really the world. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it really isn't. So we have a challenger to lithium ion. We have a newcomer and we should definitely take a look at how it could possibly, you know, and, and as the article says, threaten lithium ions dominance. So this coming from power electronics and yeah, this is an article from Sam Davis saying that rechargeable zinc air batteries could threaten lithium ions dominance, where ongoing research on rechargeable zinc air batteries indicates the potential of competing with lithium ion as the power source of choice for electronic devices. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure the article will cover this, but just to uh, make it quick, lithium ion has been around for so long because it has the ability to be, you know, to not only store energy at a decent rate, you know, it's not the best that we've, that we've ever seen it, but at a decent enough rate, while at the same time being able to discharge its energy and then recharge it and then discharge it once again, over and over and over again, it's called the cycle. And it's able to go through tens of thousands of cycles before the battery needs to be replaced. That kind of durability puts it head and shoulders above many of the other batteries. So there are drawbacks to things like, you know, these are, you know, these are uh, caustic chemicals that are found inside the battery. They're kind of hard to recycle. They, you know, they are a form of pollution, but at the same time, they just work really, really well. So a newcomer would certainly be appreciated. It's just, we haven't found that one yet. But as the article starts, Hey, it could be zinc air. So current research on zinc air batteries aims to transform this battery type from non-rechargeable to rechargeable. And to describe how rechargeable zinc air batteries work, they of course have to look at existing non-rechargeable counterparts, which are metal air batteries activated by oxidizing zinc with oxygen from the air. Makes sense. So non-rechargeable size, uh, sizes range from very small button cells from hearing aids to larger types used in cameras. So think of the little button type batteries. I guess those are metal air batteries. And you can't use zinc air batteries in a sealed battery holder because some air must come in. And the battery requires oxygen uh, in one liter of air for every ampere hour capacity. So... During the, uh, so during the discharge, blah, 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 essentially, hey, you know, uh, if you want to read more about this, we have a link to it in the show notes, but suffice to say, gets a little heady with the science. So they said that uh, due to the global abundance of zinc metal, the batteries are much cheaper to produce than lithium ion batteries. And on top of that, they can store more energy, theoretically five times more than that of lithium ion batteries and are much safer and more environmentally friendly. So check that out. And you know, again, to highlight that, five times as much energy. Imagine an iPhone with five times the battery life. Imagine uh, you know, electric cars with five times the range. It's 
super, super important when you start talking about the, these, uh, you know, these new technologies that you think about what you could do, you know, five, five times doesn't sound like that much, but when you apply that to everything that we use a battery for, it could be a huge boost. So they, uh, you know, some of the other points saying that the low temperatures uh, reduce primary cell capacity. The effect is small for low drains. A cell may deliver 80% of its capacity if discharged over 300 hours at zero degrees Celsius, but only 20% of capacity if discharged at a 50 hour rate at the same temperature. Hmm. Lower temperatures can reduce voltage. So obviously you want, you want these things to, uh, you know, run as cool and as efficiently as possible. So widespread use of zinc air batteries has been hindered by the fact that up until now, recharging them has been difficult. And yeah, you know, lithium ion, super easy, super convenient. It's uh, something that, you know, you probably do on a daily basis. And this is due to, to the lack of electrocatalysts that successfully reduce and generate oxygen during the discharging and charging of a battery. So here's the fun part. A new three-stage method to overcome this recharging problem has recently described in advanced materials where the article was authored by researchers from the University of Sydney and the Nanyang Te Technical University in Singapore. And according to the author, they're saying that the new method can be used to create bifunctional oxygen electrocatalysts for building rechargeable zinc air batteries from scratch. Saying that up until now, zinc air batteries have been made with expensive precious metal catalysts such as platinum or iridium oxide. And in contrast, our method produces a family of new high-performance and low-cost catalysts. That's another thing that keeps the battery uh, industry where it is. It may work. It may work better in the laboratory. It may be infinitely better. But if you can't produce it cheaply and on a massive scale, then what good is it to the industry? So it sounds like they have that one nipped in the bud as well. So they're saying that... Uh, they're saying that research on zinc air batteries is also ongoing at the University of Waterloo in Canada, where their research focused on the development of novel bifunction catalysts, blah, blah, blah. And they're saying that in addition, they focus on the design and performance optimization of both air and zinc electrodes, as well as a solid electrolyte membrane. Hmm. So finally, their aim is to combine the components into various forms of rechargeable zinc air battery, such as stationary, flexible, and flow cells. So obviously they, they don't want it to be a one size fits all solution. They want it to be uh, you know, flexible like batteries haven't really been known to do with lithium ion. They want it to be continuous. You know, they want it to be a lot of things. So the article ends with a number of questions, but suffice to say, they're working on it and it hasn't made it out of the lab yet. They're still working on a few details, but from what I've heard and from what this article seems to be outlining, this seems to be a pretty good alternative to lithium ion and you know, lithium ion, it can't get much better. Really. It's been developed for the past 30, 40, 50 years. It's a known technology and we're pretty much butting up against what it can do. So if we can find a replacement for it, hey, it's going to mean a lot of change very, very quickly and in a good way. So, all right, a little heady and obviously uh, a lot of science in there, but let's choose something a, you know, not so science-y. So, da, da, da. all right, here's one. And you may have heard there was a fight this weekend. And, you know, one of the good fights, one of the fights that uh, people pay a lot of money to see. And from what I understand it, the amount of money that was earned by the two fighters in this 30 minutes, well, many people will never even see that much money in their life, let alone earn it, let alone take it home. And, well, Mayweather and McGregor, you remember them? The fight... It had a problem on the technical side, which is why it fits here at Computer America, where 
yeah, it kind of sort of crashed pay-per-view servers. And that's not what you want to see when you just paid $100 to make it happen. And they said that the boxing match was delayed after streams and TV went down. Mm. And this coming from Engadget, Mr. John Fingus, saying that did you pay for an expensive pay-per-view or streaming pass to the boxing match? And, well, it may have went down. But you're far from alone, where numerous reports have revealed that servers across the United States crashed and buckled under the demand for the fight, creating outrage, out, uh, I'm sorry, or creating outages serious enough that organizers delayed the fight to make sure people could tune in. Where Mayweather himself said that pay-per-view customers, uh, said pay-per-view servers in California and Florida crashed while Showtime and UFC failed to load, ran into logging trouble, and otherwise couldn't keep up with the interest. Very interesting. And the pay-per-view issue, at a, minimum, at a minimum, are known to have affected TV providers like Comcast, Atlantic Broadband, and Frontier, although it's not clear how large of the scope the failure were at that stage. Just goes to show, when you put enough strain on a single event, things like this can happen. Because obviously the load, you know, not everyone normally tunes into a single event such as this. So, problems like this aren't completely unprecedented, where Mayweather's fight against Manny Pacquiao created hiccups of its own. However, the sheer range of failures suggested that the network still haven't created infrastructure to keep up with huge viewership spikes. And, you know, this is something that we see with a lot of different industries, where do you create the infrastructure to keep up with these spikes? even though the average load or, you know, the frequency of these spikes are going to be, you know, one or two times a year. Um, you know, you probably couldn't get enough interest every single weekend for something like this. But one or two times a year, do you build up the infrastructure, spend the millions of dollars it would take to do that for potentially two hours a year? And we're seeing in a lot of cases, no. No. No, they're, they're not going to spend that kind of money, even if it sometimes happens. It's, it's not normal. You, you try to optimize for what is normal. So, they're saying that at the same time, it also says something about how much sports viewing has changed in the past couple of years, where you're now quite likely to hear people griping en masse about access to legal online streams where they might have resorted to bootleg streams or conventional television a few years ago. And with networks like ESPN streaming the, uh, I'm sorry, rushing to stream box, uh, boxing everywhere, not just cable diehards, the importance of online access is going to increase in the near future. Essentially saying what we've all known for a while now, and that's the idea that Conventional television, it's still champion, it's still number one, and a lot of people uh, still, hey, you know, they still have cable. As much as we talk about cord cutting, and we recommend cord cutting here on Computer America, um, it's still, by and large, the most popular medium out there. But there is a growing contingency, and it's ever-increasing. Year over year, it's increasing by millions and millions, and it's not anywhere near catching up to the amount of traditional cable, but at the same time, it's something that traditional cable has to not only compete, but at the same time, support in the same field. So there you have it, and it's something that will only continue to be a pain point for these exceptionally large events. All right, so we have time for maybe one, maybe two. How about... All right, let's do this one. And do you remember Windows phones? Yeah, um, a lot of people do because it wasn't too long ago. But by then, it has since been defunct. Windows has sold off its, its uh, commanding share in, I think it was like Nokia or something like that. Uh, they sold it off to a Polish company, if I'm remembering it right. And they're making their own line of phones under Nokia uh, 3310 and things like that. But Windows as an operating system for a smartphone has not been a popular option, was never a popular option, and 
Well, that's coming around to bite a very specific clientele. And that was, shockingly, the New York Police Department. That's right. The New York Police Department is already replacing its Windows phones with iPhones. And yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of lobbying. I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, you know, deals and, uh, you know, subsidies that went into this. But the idea that the New York Police Department would run on Windows phones was pretty absurd. So here we have it. This coming from Engadget, Mr. John Fingus once again. My God, what a prolific writer. But saying that the New York Police Department is learning a hard lesson about the dangers of buying a declining smartphone platform in bulk. I would say so. Where the New York Post understands that the police force is replacing all 36,000 of its officers' Windows phones with iPhones just two years after the rollout began. And it's not exactly clear as to why, but Microsoft recently ended support for Windows Phone 8.1, and the standard issue Lumia 830 and 640 XL devices won't get any help if something goes wrong. And the switch to iPhone also suggests that the New York Police Department doesn't see a long-term value in upgrading to Windows 10 Mobile. Again, Windows, Windows as an operating system uh, for phones is still out there, but not recommended by Computer America, by anyone that we talk to. It's just, right now, it's a game between Android and iOS. Those are your options. Um, you know, you may have some other, you know, small contingencies out there. I would put things like the Ubuntu phone or uh, Linux phones in general or Windows phones. I'd kind of group them together. But a variant of Android or the closed system iOS Pretty much you're safe and your go-to bets. Where according to a source talking to the Post, the ill-fated Windows handset purchase was largely the decision of Deputy IT Commissioner Jessica Tisch, where she insisted on the platform because the NYPD was using Microsoft software for a video surveillance program in the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative Command Center. In other words, the force apparently bought phones without consultation on the mere belief that they might work more effectively with program infrastructure. And I can kind of see her point. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that if you use Microsoft in application A, then maybe application B would work better if you also had Microsoft in, app in application B. So Microsoft to Microsoft, it might work better, but as we see, just because they have the same name doesn't mean they'll have the same level of support as other platforms. And the device have made officers' lives easier. To be clear, they can receive alerts, search database, and file reports while in the field. It's just that the devices themselves may have a limited lifespan, which is very important. And the force says it won't comment on the story until after Tish's return from vacation on August 28th. And saying that if the scoop is at all accurate, it already illustrates the dangers when an organization bets on a platform with an uncertain future. And it doesn't matter how well the software works. In the short term, if its long-term fate looks grim, and outfits have to think about whether or not they'll be supported in the years to come. And obviously, very important, but let's be clear, if... You buy into it, you spend thousands, if not millions of dollars and thousands of hours training people to use it. What good is it if at the end of the day, hey, it just doesn't pan out. So there you have it. New York Police Department getting iPhones. Who knew? All right, everyone. That is just about it for here at Computer America. I want to thank our guest, Mr. Steve Stockman, and how to shoot video that doesn't suck and hopefully giving you some ideas on how to shoot instead of the still frames. Hey, shoot quick, short videos, and you may just be the new talk of your social media feed. So with that being said, tune in tomorrow as we have a great guest. Let me just pull that up here. Tomorrow on the program, we have Acronis. That's right, backup, backup, backup. How important it is to, you know, backup your data, backup your files, and backup your computers to prevent any kind of heartache. So Acronis joining us here tomorrow, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. 
And we have a full week of shows here on Computer America. Thank you for joining us. Catch you next time. Everyone, have a great day. See you then. Bye-bye.